Hello. We'll get started in just a moment. Uh, wait a few minutes in case some more people join. Sandra, how are how's the class going? Is it okay? You doing okay? Good. It's a lot of homework. I know that. I know it's a lot of homework. But that's that's part of it. So I hope it's not too much. Almost done, almost done with the course, almost done with the summer. Next week, we will review for the final exam. I'll go over how many questions, what to study. I'll review questions, that kind of thing. Done. Let's look at the schedule. So we are at the nineteenth, and we have six A. Week six material due. Today we're gonna go over seven, and seven is the last chunk of new material. So we're gonna go over the antiderivative today, and that's the last chunk of material. And then after that, uh, we will just review for the exam and we'll be done. So we're getting pretty close to the end. Um, so this is this is the last time of new material. And then after that, it's just review. But don't don't miss next week. Next week's probably more important than this week because next week I'll go over everything you need to know about the final exam, what to expect, and then hopefully by the time you take the final exam, there'll be no mystery. The actual class is over on the 30th. So every, every, everything is due on the 30th, 1159 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, going forward from now to then, I'm not going to hold you to any due dates. So the due date is just the end of the semester. So I won't penalize anybody if you need extra time for anything or if you want to go back and do anything. There's no penalty for late work, okay? The, the late work is just the end of the course. So we just need to get it all done. I know other people have other things going on. I have people email me about internships or um, they're moving or that kind of thing. So people are having to juggle certain things um, and need a little extra time or whatever. So that's fine. I'm just gonna offer everyone. It'll still be late, but there'll be no penalty. Uh, grade wise for that. So until the end of the semester, that is the cutoff. That's when everything will close and that will be your final grade once that happens. Okay. 
Yeah. You are going to go on some kind of trip where you're going to need to take the final exam early. Please let me know and I'll give you the information you need. But um, frankly, you can just start working ahead of the class if that's the case. And there's no extensions uh, for the course. So once it hits uh, the 31st, that's it. That's the end. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm probably saying that to the people that aren't here, but yeah, at least I saw. Okay. Um, now I know I haven't looked at it for a week, but I remember that the homework for last week was kind of a bear. So keep going. If you're still working on it, keep going. If you, turns out you need an extra day on the last homework so long, keep going, just keep going, okay? And the best way you can ask me uh, a question is to click on get more help and then ask my instructor. That's my preferred uh, method of you asking me a question. That way I can see your version of the problem. It sends me a link. I can look at it. I can see what you're looking at and then I can answer up, uh, according. Okay. Otherwise, I, I don't know what you're looking at and I can only make it. And um, for those that have been asking me questions, I've either, depending on the type of question, I've either just emailed you directly, and then one person, uh, I sent them a video, and I did post that video under announcements, because I felt it would have been better if I would have went over in class, but it just wasn't. So if I go to announcements, That was week six. I think I posted, I posted a few extra problems. So the, the actual lecture is there, of course. This is a week six lecture. Uh, so we have the actual lecture, and then I have some bonus problems. I posted those are totally optional. Um, if you want to use them, you may. If you don't need them, don't use them. Uh, number seven was the last one. I didn't make a video, uh, but I posted my solution to that. And that, that was pretty easy. So that's totally optional, but it's there if you need it. And I will do that for week seven as well. Okay. Uh, so what's next? What's next is we are going to go over uh, the last major topic first semester calculus that is the antiderivative so what have what have we been learning this semester what have we even been going over we go over the definition of a limit that's where we started what is a limit and then from the limit we were able to define the derivative we were able to understand okay this is how things are changing so we did that. Then from having a definition of the derivative from the limit, we were able to understand functions better. We were able to find maximum, minimum, critical points, second derivative, third derivative, and so on. We took some time uh, understanding the exponential and the logarithm. So we worked on that for a while. And then what's last is the antiderivative. So now we're going to take the we're going to go. If this is the derivative, what is the original function? And there was a few problems we worked on that touched on it, but we never we never went any further with it. So we just kind of looked at it for a second, and then we moved on. But that's what this is. So this is uh, the antiderivative or the integral. So think about if you have some function, and this is the derivative. What is the original function? That's the question. So what function can I take the derivative of? And it would just give me the number eight. Okay. So that's, that's the question we have today is, what function can I take the derivative of? And I would get back what's in this. What would it be? Well, I'll tell you. The function would be f of x equals 18x 
And in truth, it could have some number attached to it. So it could have some number C, just some constant, some number. Because look, if I take the derivative of this, df dx, what would this be? The constant just goes away and you just get back 18. So that is, that is the correct function that we want. Now what's going on over here? That's what this is asking. So this is called an integrand. It's like a fancy S. Um, and so with this fancy S, it's telling us that we want to find the antiderivative. Here it's just the number 18 for yours. It might be a different number, but it, the same is true for any number. The dx tells me what variable we're thinking of. So this is the variation. This is the thing that it's changing. We, we practiced a lot with that too, right? We've talked a lot about dy f prime of x dx. We spent a lot of time with that last week. So this is telling me the variable, which is changing. This is telling me what the derivative of the original function is. And I'm trying to find what function is that. So I think it's, 18x plus c, okay? And you always have to put that plus c. I'll tell you when you don't need to put the plus c later on when we get to that. But right now, in this form, we always want to. And this is the antiderivative, and it's also called the interval. This is the interval. Now, integrals start really easy, like this one. I just put an x on there and plus c. That's easy. They get harder and harder and harder until eventually they're unsolvable. Okay, there's many integrals that are impossible to solve with uh, fundamental functions, and then you have to use more and more and more advanced techniques to solve them just a little bit. So we can. Um, and when I learned that, when I learned that there was integrals that were unsolvable, that blew me. Now. I don't know if it will for you or if I'll be able to bring it up. We're not going to see those today. They'll only feel unsolvable, uh, but we'll be able to solve all of those, which is good. All right, let's look at something like this. And we could use any number, but this one gave us x to the seventh. So I have x to the seventh dx. I want some function where the derivative is x to the seventh. So I'm gonna take the derivative of some function and it gives me x to the seventh, okay? So when I take the derivative of a function, what happens? What do I do? Let's go, let's go back before we go forward. So let's say I'm just dealing with x squared, just going all the way back. If I take the derivative of this, what happens? Two comes down and that becomes a one. So we just get two X, right? That was the deal with powers. So the power is less than one and whatever the exponent was, it just comes down, right? This does not have a coefficient. So with whatever I put there, it needs to go away, okay? If I had something like x to the third, what's the derivative of this? It's three x squared, okay? But that's left with a three. This only has a one. So whatever I do, I don't want it to be there anymore, okay? And then what happens to the exponent? Well, if I take the derivative, it gets one smaller. So if I wanna go backwards, this must have been x to the eighth, okay? So if I'm going backwards, the exponent has to increase by one. But when I take the derivative of this, I need it to go back to one. So I'm gonna put one eighth and that should do it. I'm gonna check, but that, that should do it. If I take the derivative of this, d over dx of one eighth x to the eighth, what happens? The eight comes down and you get one eighth times eight x to the seventh, and those cancel, and you're left with x to the seventh, which was the goal, okay? 
So what does that mean? That means that this must be 1 8 x to the 8 plus some constant. So I can take the derivative, and that constant would go away. That is the idea. So these are easy enough where we can see a pattern pretty quickly. What's happening? The exponent is just increasing by 1, and I'm just dividing by that exponent. That's all that's happening. Okay, that's, that's all that's happening. So we could come up with another example if I wanted to take the integral of x to the 2 thirds dx. I just increase the exponent by 1. 2 thirds plus 3 over 3 equals 5 thirds. And then I just divide by the exponent. So this would become 3 fifths x to the 5 thirds plus c. So you can do it with fractions as well as you can do it with whole numbers. And you can do it with negative numbers. And you can do it with decimals. But that's, that's the pattern. That's the pattern. And since a lot of time we spent taking derivatives with just powers, we're going to see that we're doing that a lot. It going backwards, the integrals. Okay. okay. And just again, speak of the devil and it shall appear. I have to do that right now. I have an exponent with a fraction. Okay. So they're giving me the derivative is x to the six sevenths. Okay. So I need to figure out what function. Do I take the derivative of? Gives me this. That's I need to go backwards. Well, what happens? I know I need to add one to that. I need it to increase by one. So what would that be? Well, that would be six over seven plus seven over seven. And um, that's 13 sevenths. Okay, so the exponent has to be x to the 13 sevenths. But it doesn't have a coefficient. It has a coefficient of one. So when I take the derivative of this, I need that to go away. I need it to just go to one. So I think I should multiply this by 7 13 That way, when the person takes the derivative of this, it goes away, and they should get 6 7 Okay. So I think the original function is this. Let's test it and make sure that that's true. Okay. So let's take d over dx, 7 thirteenths x to the 13 sevenths, and just make sure that that's true. If I bring this down, what do I get? 7 thirteenths times 13 sevenths x to the 13 over 7 minus 1 which is 13 sevenths minus seven over seven. Okay. And six sevenths. Cancels X to the six sevenths. So that looks right. All right. So I think the answer is 7 thirteenths x to the 13 sevenths plus c, that original constant. Can't forget that c. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Just going backwards. Way back when I said that um, because we showed that you can take the limit individually. So if terms are broken up, you can take the limit individually, like x goes to 2 of x squared plus Let's do minus 7x plus 4. 
that this is the same thing as taking the limit as x approaches two for x squared minus the limit as x approaches two for seven x plus the limit as x approaches two for four. That you can break those terms up and it would be the same limit. So we're all going all the way back. That's true. You can break those up. I claim, and I'm not going to prove, but I claim that because that's true, since all is built from the limit, if that's true, then I can do that with integrals too. If integral is just based off the limit. So I think you could break this up. And we'll see. It's so easy. You don't even have to. But for more complicated ones, you do. You could break this up. And it would be the same interval in the end. You need that for future problems. But I claim that's true because the limit, which all of this is based off the limit, because the limit can be broken up with addition and subtraction, and then it is still the same limit. They're going all the way to the integral to the end of this class, that that is still the same integral. Okay, it can break up with addition and subtraction. So because of that, I can just take the pieces individually and I don't have to think about it all at once, which is really handy. It's nice that it turns out so easy. All right, now this one is actually so easy. We don't really need to do that, but I'm gonna keep hammering that home because, uh, well, that's really important, especially when it gets hard and, and then the case where you can't. All right, so what would we take the derivative of to get this? That's what I'm looking for. So f prime of x equals x cubed minus seven x plus four. What do I take the derivative to get this? So f of x has to equal something. When I take the derivative of it, I get x cubed. So what must it have been before? x to the fourth, it had to been. Okay, when I take the derivative of this, I'll get x cubed, but I don't want that uh, four there. I don't want it. It can't be there. When I take the derivative, I need it to go back to one. So I'm gonna say that this is a one fourth. That way you take the derivative and it'll just be x cubed. That's what we had before. All right, now to keep the seven, I have an x there. So I need to increase that power. Okay, so if I increase the power, it becomes two. Increase it by one. Now that's not negative 14, that's negative seven. So I need that two to go away. So I'm gonna multiply this by one half. That way, when you take the derivative of it, it goes back to what it was. And then the four X, I'm sorry, the four doesn't have an X. It doesn't have anything there. There's nothing attached to it. It's just a four. So I increase that power and I get four X. Okay. And since that's just the number one, we don't have to worry about taking the derivative. It'll just go back to four. All right. So that has to be the original function. Now there could have been a constant that we don't know about because when you take the derivative of it, it would go away. So it could have had some starting value that we don't know about. But when you take the derivative of it, we lose that piece of information. So we don't have that. So I think in the end, what we would have is we would have one fourth x to the fourth minus seven halves x squared plus four x plus c. So let's take it piece by piece. As far as the student's view, what's going on? All of the exponents of x are increasing by one. We're dividing by whatever we increased it. Okay. So if it was a third, now it's a four, you divide by four. If anything was negative, it continues to be negative. Okay? Unless that was a negative exponent, that would be the only time that would mess us up. All right. But we're saying that if you take the derivative of this function, you will get back this and that's the idea so you can always check that to make sure that that's true that's the idea now we're going backwards 
I haven't even explained why we're going backwards. Turns out that it's really important, but I right now it's more important of how do you do it, and then we'll go over why do you do it. Why would you do it? Okay. But if you were given the derivative, could you find the original function? Or could you, you know, one less? Okay. Or if that was the second group, could you find the first group? Back. All right. Well, let's talk about why would you even care about this? Why would you even care about this? Well, a lot of times, especially in physics and physical motion, the only thing you can know. You don't know where anything starts, but you know how fast it's going. So that happens a lot. So a lot of times uh, in mechanics and just the physical movement of things, you know how fast, you don't know where it started, but you know how fast it's going. Okay, So you don't know, oh, well, it started here and then it traveled along this line and it ended here. No, you just took a snapshot right there. Okay, so the police, uh, ray gun got your speed right here so they don't know that you stopped at the grocery store before and then went around the bend and they don't know any of that. they just know how fast you're going at that moment okay well it turns out if you know that for a function you can make the function that must be true okay you can say okay well this person or this item is going this fast so that must mean going back one it must have started here or we can say at least it went back here, right? That's the idea. So that's one application of this, all right? And it may seem, I don't know how it seems, um, but it turns out that was the purpose of finding this. So all of this, to my knowledge, was been developed by Isaac Newton, who was trying to figure out planets. So all of this is just planetary science, right? That was the idea. And then there's a whole bunch of consequences that come up because of that. So we were, he was trying to solve one problem, and he ended up solving infinite problems to develop it. So that's how good he was. Um, we'll get over. Uh, there's another consequence uh, that this critically has. We don't need it now. So let's keep going with how do you do it. And later we'll go over why you would do it. Okay. All right, this one I'd say is similar, right? Uh, we want to find if this is the derivative, we're going to find the original function. So all of the x exponents have to increase by one. So f prime of x is going to be nine times some number x to the third. But I want the third, when I take the derivative, I want it to go away. So I'm going to have to multiply that by one third. That way the three goes away. Now what about this four? Take that, x will become x squared, and we need the two to go away, so I'll put a one half. And then the five doesn't have an X, so it's gonna to have to gain one X there. And then it could have some constant, could have some starting position. We don't know where that is, but it, it probably started somewhere. So from there, we clean this up a little bit. Nine divided by three is three. And four divided by two is two. And that's five to x plus c, some starting point you don't know about. Right? Just like in y equals mx plus b, the y-intercept, where does it start? This would have a y-intercept as well. So that's our function. Kelsey, does that make sense? Mm 
What do we do if it was in the denominator? Well, just like derivatives, I personally want to rewrite this so it has a negative exponent because that makes it easier. So just like with derivatives, I'm just going to rewrite this. Okay? It makes it easier. And it's still true. I mean, that's the same thing. So I can just rewrite it. All right, what did we do before? Well, we always increased the exponent by one. So I think, I think we should continue to do that. So what is that gonna be? X negative 11 plus one would be negative 10. So we're continuing to increase it by one. That's no problem. And then we always divide it by that exponent. So one over that exponent. So I think we should do that again. So that'd be one over negative uh, 10. Okay. That should do it. We can rewrite this as negative one over 10 X to the 10th. And then of course, plus C, because we don't know where it started. From there we can. So even with negative exponents, you're just increasing it by one, just like you would with a positive exponent. So from negative 10 plus one, whoops. I still think it's easier to rewrite it with a negative exponent with derivatives and integrals, I think it's easier because we just think of the power, it's just easier for me. I seem to make less mistakes if I just think about it as a number. And I'm gonna do that for this one too. So what do we have here? So for number seven, we have the integral, and this is, it looks like seventh root to me. That looks like the seventh root. So let's go back. So root x is x to the one half. Cube root is x to the one third, and so on and so on and so on. So the seventh root would be x to the one seventh dx. Now, what, what's going to happen? I'm going to take that one seventh, and I'm going to add one to it. I'm just going to increase it by one. Well, what's that? That's one seven plus seven over seven. One, uh, the eight sevens. Okay, so that's the exponent. So we get x to the eight sevens, but we want to divide by that. Okay? So we want to go one over eight sevens. The reciprocal of eight sevens is seven eighths. So we just flip it upside down. So seven eighths. Okay. That was all okay. Plus C. So we don't know where it started. But that should do it. But that's what you do if it's fractional or this. All right, what happens here? Well, I think the first step for this one would to be rewrite it with whatever that exponent is. I think that's just a good thing to start with. So we have cube root x squared. Remember, cube root of x is x to the one third. So I would say the cube root of x squared would be x to the two thirds. Let's rewrite that. Would be first order. X to the two thirds VX. That should do it. From there, what do we do? Okay, so we want to increase that by one. So we have two thirds plus one. That's two thirds plus three over three. Well, that's five thirds. 
So from there, what do we have? We have x to the 5 thirds. Well, when we take the derivative, I need that to go to 1. So I'm going to multiply this by its reciprocal so it does so. And then I will add c because I don't know where it started. So I think that's 3 fifths x to the 5 thirds plus c. Can't forget that plus c. Did you have? Mine was like mine's the square root of x to the eleven. There's no there's no one there. Let's see what if x to the eleventh? Yeah. Dx. So I think that that is the same thing as x to the 11 halves, because that square root's like a two. Okay, so if that's the case, then we need to increase that by one. 11 halves plus two over two, and that would be 13 halves. Okay. So I think that's x to the 13 halves, and I need to take, when I take the derivative of it, I need that to go away because it is not an original. So I think that would be two thirteenths plus c. Okay. I forgot to put the constant. <laughs> hey, and now, I, now you're in the club. Everyone forgets the constant. In fact, um, even when I, when I first uh, joined Facebook, the memes started to become a thing. There were math memes of don't forget the plus c. Um, believe it or not, math nerds. Found that too. Don't get plus C. Very easy to do. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Now we have dx over x to the tenth, at least with my numbers. Okay. Let's rewrite it. I think that's going to be the easiest way. So that would be the same thing as x to the negative 10 dx. And that's derivative, so we want to find the original. So the first step is to take that exponent and add one, and I get negative nine. So it's going to be x to the negative ninth, but that didn't have a coefficient. So I need to divide by the new coefficient. So that would be one over negative nine. I can rewrite that a little better. Negative one over nine x to the ninth. Then let's see. I think the computer accepts little uh, lowercase c or capital C. I think it accepts both, but um, I don't think there's much difference. That's the idea. Good to get this, crack this up. All right, let's rewrite this. So that'd be six x to the negative one dx. So I go negative one plus one equals zero. Hmm. That's kind of strange. So if I followed along, then I would have what? I would have 6x to the 0th 
divided by zero. That doesn't make any sense. You remember what this was? The derivative of the natural log? That was? So that's what you do if it's just a negative one. Since we know that the derivative of the natural log is one over x, and that's what we have, then this must be. Six. Let's just let's rewrite it. Make it absolutely clear. So the six doesn't matter. I can pull that. Out. Six is just a number. So I pull that out. What is the integral of x to the negative one? Well, I know that that must be ln and x because the derivative of natural log of x is one over x. So this is just six times the natural log of x plus c. Now we do have to be a little careful. What do we have to be careful about? We don't want to go outside the domain. So we're going to say that that's the absolute value of x to make sure that we're not going out of the domain. So that's one that doesn't follow the pattern. So we have to remember that. If it's just something over x or uh, the integral of one over x, is the natural log of x, it's absolute value of x. That's the deal. Now we studied the derivative a lot. We did the derivative of natural log a lot, but sometimes when we throw ourselves out of context, it gets confusing. Okay. So that's the idea, we can't forget that. I think it'll come up a few times in my homework, but um, that's one for your cheat sheet for sure. Don't forget that. We'll see something like that happen again here. We're going to take the integral of seven times x to the negative one minus six x to the negative three dx. Now, if you want, you can take these piece by piece. Uh, we say that that's equivalent because we can break up limits so we can break up integrals. So that would be the same thing as seven, the in, seven times the integral of x to the negative first minus six x to the negative third. These are equivalent statements. All three of those are equivalent statements. I can break these up just like I can with algebra. I can break up things and start manipulating them and making them easier for me to solve just as well as I can for this. So that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, now we just talked about, call it again, that the integral of one over x dx is the natural log of absolute value of x plus c. We did that before, we're gonna do it again. So that means this is seven times natural log of x and then plus C, but we'll just save that. Minus, and what's going on here? We have six, we'll tack that on. We have X to the negative third, we add one, that becomes negative two. So this is X to the negative two. And then we divide by that number, so that'd be negative one half plus C. Hopefully that's okay. So I think it's seven natural log of X plus, now these are gonna cancel because we have negative times negative as positive. We have a three X to the negative two plus C. And then you can see how I typed it in the computer, natural log of X 
plus three over x squared. Let's see. Yeah. Harder. That's it. Any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms about that? So, first thing I want to do is rewrite this to make it a little bit easier for myself. So there's a negative two, that's fine. X to the, now what is that? It says seven root X to the six. Okay, well, I know square root of X is X to the one half, so that means Seventh root of x equals x to the one seventh. So that means that this must be x to the six seventh. Okay. Just rewriting that. Actually, I don't want to circle. Negative two. And since it's in the denominator, it's also negative. And that would be the six sevenths dx. If we like, we can pull out the negative two out of the integral. It's no problem for us. We can pull that out and just focus on what we're taking an integral of. So I need to add one to that exponent and then divide by it. So negative six sevenths plus one. That's negative six sevenths plus seven over seven. And I suppose that would be one seven. Like that's one seven. Okay. So from there, we have negative two x to the one seven, positive one seven. And we want to divide by this one seven. So that's times seven because. One divided by one seventh is seven. The reciprocal of this is negative two times seven, negative fourteen x to the one seventh plus c. If you like, we can write it in terms of the radical negative fourteen seven root x plus c. And all antiderivatives of the following function. Okay. So they want us to take the integral of e to the negative 12x dx. What is that? Let's think about e to the x before we do it. What is the derivative of e to the x? The derivative of e to the x. E to the x is its own derivative. That's it. It, has it. it is its own derivative. That's one of the definitions of it. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So remember that. And what else can we say? Well, what was the derivative of something like e to the 2x? What happened when we have an x over? So by chain rule, what we found was the two came down and we would just get a copy of what we had before. That's two e to the two x. So that was the derivative. So we're saying 
that e to the negative 12x is the derivative. And we want something where they take the derivative of it and they get back this. Okay. So how would you do that? Well, the derivative of it is the same. That has to be true. So we know we're still going to get e to the negative 12x. Okay. We know that's a part of it. When you take the derivative of this, you get it back. So that's part of it. Now, instead of tacking on negative 12 in the front, I don't think we should do that because what we want is when you take the derivative of it, that goes to one. So I think you should do negative one over 12. I think that would do it. When you take the derivative of this, the negative 12 comes down and it goes to one. And I'll add C there. So that's what I think the integral should be. Let me try to prove that. So D over DX, negative 112, E to the negative 12X plus C is what? Okay, so the 12 comes out, negative 112 times, negative 12 e to the negative 12 x. And then the c, the constant, whatever, if it was a number five, it just goes to zero. So that goes to zero. These cancel, negative, negative is a positive, and you're just left with e negative 12 x. That's what we were supposed to do. So it checks out, this checks out. Sandra, you good? Fourteen brings um similar. It's similar. Okay, we I have three e to the two x dx. Thanks, Cassandra. Uh. So I claim that this would be the same thing. I could pull the three out. That's no different. E to the two X DX. Okay, well, remember, it is its own derivative, okay? And we do have two X this time. I want where they take the derivative of it and the coefficient is one, okay? At least for this part, what's in the integral. So what do I have to do? Three comes along, I can just pull that out, that's fine. I'll have e to the two x, that's for sure. And instead of the two coming out, I think we should put one half because I want to counteract that two. Should do and then plus c. So if I rewrite this, that's three halves e to the two x plus c. Answer is. So instead of multiplying by the exponent coefficient, I'm dividing by. And so far, I haven't really had to, you know, go too in depth of the chain rule or all of that. I mean, we can, but we don't really have to. If it's just a number, it's pretty easy to just pick out the pieces. But uh, in that homework, I remember we got through some pretty tricky problems uh, where the exponent was something like, or the exponent itself was an expression. And in that case, we would have to take more of our time. Change right now. We just a number, just a number. Good on that. Okay, so that's that's the first chunk. That was the minimum I wanted to get through. So we did it. Okay, so everything else is great. I was like, we have to go over the first fourteen. <clears throat> like, have to get through this for sure. And I did. So we're good. All right, let's keep going. If I can, I want to go through the first 20. 
21, we'll see what happens. Okay, I claim I pull out the four, and it'll be the same thing. I just need to remember to do that. Okay, this is pretty much the same idea, right? Before it was a two, now it's a 0 0.5 or negative one. But this is the same idea. D over dx, a v to the x, is e to the x, that's no problem. E dx of e to the negative 0 0.5x is negative 0 0.5e to the negative 0.5x. Just the number comes up front, okay, by chain rule, by chain rule, that's true. So what's gonna happen with this? Well, I need to counteract that, but I can, that's no problem. So I'm definitely going to get E negative 0.5x plus C. What's going to be the coefficient? Well, if I'm taking a derivative of it, it's going to come up front. But I need to counteract that. So I think it's 1 over negative 0 0.5. I need to kind of think about that for a second and what that is. But that's where I think we are as far as the uh, calculus goes. Okay, so what is one over negative 0 0.5? So I think that's two, right? Because that's one half. That's a little bit going back to arithmetic. I can check a calculator as well. That's another way of checking this. Uh, that would be the same thing as negative one half, which I claim is negative two. Okay. So that's four times negative two e times x c. And four times two is eight. That should do it. See if I can make it to question 20. Very similar. I'm going to rewrite it. 2 e to negative 0 0.1 x, which is 110 dx. We know e over dx, e to the x, it's just e to the x. So d dx of e negative 0 0.1 x is negative 0 0.1 x. Oops, well, fast here. E 0. If we've taken the derivative of it, we just end up on the side, just as the coefficient. Okay, but we want to counteract that. So this would be 2 times e negative 0 0.1 x. C, and we don't want to just put negative 0.1, we have to do 1 over negative 0.1. So, what number is that? Well, 1 over negative 0 0.1 is 1 over negative 1 to 10, so that would be a negative 10. Two negative ten e negative point one x c two times negative ten is negative twenty. Here I'm given the derivative and I'm given a point. I want to find the original function. 
Well, I'll try. So they give me the derivative. They give me a point. And they say find the original function. If they give me a point, then I can find that constant. I'd be able to find the original constant because I know where it exists. So I'll be able to find that starting value. All right, so let me see if I can. So I'll take the integral, 4x minus 5 dx. Now I can take these apart if you want. So what would happen? 4x dx minus 5 dx. What do you get? Four. Right now, this has an exponent of one. Increase that by one. That gives me a two. But I have to divide by that exponent. So that's one half. Minus. This doesn't have an x. It's going to gain one. And then plus c. And I can clean it up. 4 divided by 2 is just 2x squared minus 5x plus c. And I claim that if you take that derivative, you'll get back the derivative they said. 4x minus 5, yeah, that's going to work. So that's our integral. But they say that the function goes through that point. So that means f of 8 equals 0. So from there, as long as my function is correct, I can go 2, 8 squared minus 5 times 8 plus c equals 0 and solve for c. Eight minus forty plus c equals zero. Eighty-eight plus c equals zero. C equals negative eighty-eight. All right. If I know what c is, I know what the derivative is. I think I know what the original function was. Two x squared. Minus 5x minus Put 18 right. Okay. Derivative x squared minus 4. And they give me a point f of 0 equals 9. So I should be able to find c. And then I'll find the whole function. So I get integral f prime of x dx will give me f of x, okay, enough. Integral x squared minus four dx. I'm gonna add one to the exponent, but I need to counteract that. So that would be one third. Okay. The negative four didn't have an x, so it gets one, it was of order zero, now it's of order one and then plus c. Now, I need to check. If I take the derivative of this, do I get back the derivative? I better. Three comes down, that goes to one x squared, that's what I need, minus four x, the x will just go to zero, or the number one, so you'll get negative four, that's fine, and then the plus c. Okay, that's the function. They give me a point, so that means I can plug that in, and find C. So, one third 
times zero is cubed minus four times zero plus c equals nine. That goes to zero, that goes to zero. It looks like c equals nine. True, and f of x must have been one third x cubed minus four x squared. Nope, not squared. Four x plus nine. I should do it. I'm given the derivative, I'm given the point, I'm going to find the original function. Okay. Well, I think the integral that should be integral of the uh, derivative should be the original function. So let's see. A over root x dx. Let's rewrite it and see what happens. So I'm going to write that as 8x to the negative 1 half dx. I think that's equivalent. So with the exponent, I'm going to add 1. I have negative 1 half plus 1. That's negative half plus 2 over 2. That's positive 1. x to the positive half, when it takes the derivative, I need that to go away. I think that's okay. Reciprocal, which is 2, and then plus c. Plus two. Clean that up a little bit. 8 times 2 is 16. x to the 1 half plus c. And that should be good enough to get us to find C itself. I'm going to solve for C. F of 1 equals 29 with my numbers. That means 29 equals 16x to the 1. Whoop, let's put that in. 1 to the 1 half. Let's see. Okay, well, the square root of 1 is just 1. So that looks like that's just 29 minus 16 equals C, and that's going to be 13. So C equals 13. So the final answer is the original function. It's 16, and then I can write this with the radical. What do you do something like this? What's going on here? What does that two mean? What does that zero mean? What do those mean? This is we're taking the derivative, or I'm sorry, we're finding the integral from zero to two on that interval. So we're going x is going from 0, including 0, to 2. We're finding the integral on that, just like we found the derivative on intervals. Now we're finding the integral on intervals. Now this one's really easy. Remember we did 
something like this earlier, that was really easy. We just put an X on it. So that's just 11X plus C. So that's no problem. What do you do about this evaluating on an, ent on an interval? Well, we're going to, just as, as it says, we're going to evaluate on an interval from zero to two. So if we do that, let's start with the higher term. That would be 11 times two plus C minus, because we just want that interval on the real number line from zero to two. We wanna know what these values are. So from there, we'll just go two minus evaluating it at the first point, zero. Let's see. So that's 22 plus C minus zero. What's going to happen? The C is going to get canceled out. Plus C plus C. That C gets canceled out. Does that C just get canceled out in this problem? Or is that going to happen in all the problems? That happens with all of the problems. Whatever C was, that will always get canceled because you'll always subtract it. So the C, the constant, will always cancel when we evaluate we evaluate from A to B, whatever those numbers are, that C goes away. We no longer need to do plus C because the C will just cancel out. That is the idea. Now, what are we, what are we even doing here? Are we just playing with numbers? Are we just playing with symbols to fill our days? What we're doing is we're finding it turns out the area under that line from zero to two. What it turns out is that's the area of that triangle. Believe it or not. Now, who cares that we just discovered another way to find the area of a triangle? Nobody. Nobody cares. But it turns out people care a lot when they, if you can say, well, this is how your money is spending. So this is how much money you've spent over this time. And it turns out you can use this interval to find the uh, amount spent of a company, amount spent on anything. The total, the sum of this using this technique. It's the area under the curve. So that's extraordinarily helpful. You can also find uh, this is the distance covered. If you're thinking about it physically, um, gosh, I mean, it has infinite uh, possibilities there. That it's uh, critical to understand that. Let's do one more. I wanted to at least get to 21. So let's do that before the break. Shouldn't be too bad. We're going from zero to nine with just X. So I want to increase the exponent by one. And then when you check the derivative of this, that needs to go away. So it's one half. So one half X squared plus C. But we're gonna evaluate that from zero to nine. Okay. And the C will always cancel out. That would be one half. 9 squared minus 1 half 0 squared. I guess that would be 81 over 2. If this is just going to go to 0 for my numbers. I don't know about your numbers. That's just 81 divided by 2 for my numbers. 
what did I just find? I found that from zero to nine, the area of that triangle. That's what I just figured out. What is the area of a triangle? One and a half base times height. What did we get? One half x times x. It's the area of the triangle. That's what it is. You think, oh boy, well, good for you. You've discovered a way of complicating triangles and then we didn't need to. But I claim if you can write an equation for a triangle and sum that up, you can do that for other geometric shapes. You could do that for a circle. So that means you could, if you can write an equation for a circle, you could find the area of a circle. You should be able to using this technique. And then going beyond this class, what if you allowed me two dimensions or three dimensions, I could find the area of a sphere. So I could use this technique. If you allow me more than one variable, I could find the area of a sphere or I could find the area of a pool. Maybe the water only goes up here. So I have some cylinder, I could do that. Maybe the water is coming in and I want to see how fast it goes out. That's when the rocket science starts coming out because then you can start. If you can do this, then you can start figuring out, okay, you have a rocket ship that's burning fuel. It's getting lighter. It's going this fast. How far is it going to travel? You can start doing actual literal rocket science. This page. Literal rock. This is, what it'll, this is the beginning of that. It's the very beginning of that. Very exciting stuff. So this is incredibly powerful. Right now we're just practicing on how do you do it? And just, you know, the very basics of what do you do? And in some sense, it's, uh, well, in a lot of sense, it's infinitely adding these up, okay? This is infinitely adding up. And right before, uh, <laughs> Right before the break, I just want to add, what, where does this fall apart? Okay, so three dimensions, great. That means I can start, if you allow me more variables, I can start doing more complicated, um, you know, I can do more complicated shapes and that kind of thing. Um, is there any part where this breaks? Is there any part where that falls apart? There is a part where that falls apart. And that's what if this isn't continuous? So what if you have some, well, think about it visually. You have some function that goes like that and then it stops and it stops and it stops and it stops. We had trouble with that with our limits. We had trouble with that with our derivatives. We'll have trouble with that with our intervals. And so you could have these like stops and that's an issue, or you could think of you have an infinitely discrete function where it just is going like this, but there's no in between parts. That's a problem, right? You can't integrate that. There, there's no, there's no function to integrate. But you know there must be some value. You should be able to add this up. Why am I bringing this up? Because that's what I studied in grad school. That's what I worked on was to prove that you can do it. It's, it's known, but that's what I worked on. So this stuff is kind of near and dear to my heart because that's what I worked on. That's what my thesis was about, was if you have some function, um, you can break that function up. Oh, I can't do that with this one. But you can, you can break it up so it's uh, discrete and you can still, you can still come up with an interval. It does it, but it turns out you have to you have to go the other way instead of it's actually kind of simple, but um, instead of doing dx in some ways, I'm just adding up the, the y values. That's how you do it. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the idea. So that's it. Um, that's the idea of the integral. Uh, we're gonna take a break now. Let's take.
next. I think we can probably take a 15 minute break. We'll come back and then we'll get into when integrals get harder. <laughs> Pretty much what we're looking for. All right. So um, let's take 15, come back and see harder examples of integrals.
and study, and then that's just who you work under. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the three things that I think are the most practical is, it doesn't sound practical at all when I say it, but there are numbers that are uncomputable. You cannot, you cannot compute them. There's no, there's no function that computes these numbers. There's yeah. only a set of rules that do this, and those are of great interest, of course, because what would be uncomputable? So things that are uncomputable, um, it's right on the line of like, you know, and you could imagine, well, everything's computable, right? Not everything. So it, they would be like right on the side of the unknown, right? That's, yeah. That would be where, and if you could go, oh, well, it turns out this actually is, we thought it was uncomputable, it is computable, and then that's that's what you want. That that would be the goal, is to, is to find something you thought was uncomputable, it turns out it is, or it connects to this. Um, so that would be a great interest to industry and universities. And stuff. So that would be something that would be interesting, and then doing all that. That would be of great interest. But then there's a few other things that are not that I just find interesting. I have no idea if they have any practical application. Well, but they are they're certainly interesting to those that are interested in such there's uh, geometries that don't exist in the physical world. Like if you go higher dimensions, you can study geometries of the physics kind of private reality. <laughs> and that can be interesting. Uh, the only practical application I could think of that is like make a pretty cool video. And I can't think of anything else that it would help with. So you don't like any of the simple ones. <laughs> well, nobody needs to research that. That's pretty yeah. well. And now with artificial intelligence, like that's a really good. You now we have a computer that can look, figure it out. Pretty, pretty well covered. I mean, if you find something missing, you're going to be famous. Yeah. Because if you if you publish something brand new about something simple, that must mean like it's just astounding that that happened. It happened so it happens in like one generation. It would with something simple was overlooked, and you publish it. Anyway, so you gotta you gotta kind of go to the complicated stuff. My buddy that um he studied he's all but dissertation physics degree, and he's working with the supercomputer. They're doing like simulation stuff in the computer. So it's like mm -hmm. the laboratory is just like a computer simulation. Like this is what. It, you know. Like that's kind of where everything's going. So it'd be theoretical yeah. math. In that world. Okay. Um, so for our class for this afternoon, I'm gonna teach this out of order because I want to there's certain problems I want to make absolute certain I get through, and then everything else uh, not as critical for me. So I'm gonna start at question 15. And I'm going to go up to hopefully 31. That's my goal. With whatever time I have, I'll go back and come back. But I need to get through these because I think these would be, these are more critical. So I'm starting right now at 7B, problem 15. And I'm going to go through these problems. Okay. Now, why am I doing that? The reason I'm doing that is because. We're going to start looking at integrals, antiderivatives, the opposite of derivative. And here, right here, we're running into a very big problem. Okay. What is this? What is this problem? Uh, so if we took the derivative of this, now we're supposed to find the antiderivative. But notice if you take the derivative of this, that's product rule. How do you do product rule backwards? That's that's the issue. 
And it turns out not easily. That's the issue. So there's a few things that happen at this point um, in our situation. We have two functions and we can't just break them apart. I can not just say, you know, with addition and subtraction, I can break things up. Okay, so I claim that, you know, if we have something like f prime of x plus g prime of x dx, we can say, okay, well, that's just f prime of x dx plus g prime of x. And I say just as if that was an obvious statement, but that's the idea. If it was addition, you could just break them up. That's no problem. With multiplication, that's not true. These are these are conjoined. There is no separate terms. I can't break these up. And if I can't break them up, I don't know what to do. Okay. Because we need to do some kind of product rule that we don't know what to do with. Well, what on earth are we going to do? Let's go real slow on this one. Well, maybe we can figure it out and then we'll speed up on the other ones. But let's take our time for this. Let's say f of x equals three plus x to the seventh to the fifth, and g of x equals seven x to the sixth. Right? Let's just take these apart and see what's going on. Again, remember product rule. What was going on with product rule? That was f prime of g plus f of g prime. Let's see what happens with this. What is f prime? So f prime, you take the five, it comes down. Seven plus x to the seventh to the fourth. And then that would just be seven x to the sixth. Okay. I'm still stuck. Doesn't quite help me. Hmm. So what can we do? Well, notice, does this, does this help in any way? What does that mean? I notice that there's a piece there. So those are shared. Yeah. Okay, so something's happening. These are the same. So these are related in some way. These functions are related. That makes me think, okay, well, maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'll try this. That's not going anywhere. Let's try this. What if I let the thing inside let three plus x to the seventh, let's just set that equal to a variable. If I did that, which would be kind of like chain rule, then du dx would equal 7x to the sixth. And I have that. I have that piece. That means that du would be 7x to the sixth dx. And I have this. I have that right there. So I have that piece. It's sitting right there. So that means that this could be my du, because I have that piece. du equals this, which means I can rewrite this as u to the fifth du. And I know how to solve that. What did I do? I let the thing inside the parentheses equal u. I took the derivative of u, and it turned out, by coincidence, that I had that waiting for me. It was sitting there waiting for me. 
okay, so that was sitting there waiting for me. That's great luck. So I can substitute that piece for du, and now I just have the integral of u to the fifth du, and I know how to solve this. That must be u to the sixth. Let's see. No, that from previous lecture, and that's true. I can now sub in my u right here. So that's one sixth, three plus x to the seventh to the six plus c. And that's the answer. That's the original function. So if you take the derivative of this function, you will get this. So I use substitution. That's what I ended up doing. But it's only by coincidence that that worked out. What do you do if that doesn't work out? Well, if you're interested in that, take calculus too. And that's one of the things that we work on in Calc 2. As we figure out how do you take the product rule backwards. That's what we do. That's one of the things you, that's one of the first things you work on in Calc 2. So we need to focus on this substitution. Okay, let's keep trying that. That worked for this one. Maybe it'll work for the next one. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm going to go to 31 if possible. Let's so just keep going. All right. What do I have? I have 1 plus x to the fifth squared times x to the fourth. Well, let's see what happens if I let the thing. in the parentheses be the variable, then du dx equals 5x to the fourth. Last time, that's exactly what I had. This time, I don't exactly have that. I don't exactly have that. I kind of have that, but not exactly. OK, so that means that du equals 5x to the fourth dx. What do I have? I have x to the fourth dx. I almost have it, but not quite. I don't quite have it. du equals 5 times x to the fourth dx, and I have x to the fourth dx. I wish there was a 5 there, but there isn't. So how can I counteract that 5? I can make it a 1 fifth. I think that would work. So I think I can rewrite this as u squared times one fifth du. That would be equivalent. And if you believe that, then I can just pull out the one fifth. I don't need it. I'll just put that at the end. Now I'll just take the derivative with respect to u. And the two becomes a three. And then I need to divide by that. So that's one third plus c. So that's one fifteenth u to the third plus c. Now I can sub my u in terms of x. So that's 1 15th, 1 plus x to the fifth to the third plus c. All right, what did we do? We let the thing in the parentheses be our new variable, u. We took the derivative with respect to x, chain rule. OK. We found that du was five times the thing we needed it to be. So I counteracted by dividing by five. That means they would be the same. So I found that du, or I should say one fifth of du equaled 
x to the fourth dx. That's how I said it. On now. We're starting to get into trickier stuff here. That one makes sense. Maybe. <clears throat> Did something happen? Yeah, I think I may have like this part, so I don't think I think something like at the worst part. What was your problem? Mine is yeah, I think and then seven. So. You know what? I just want to try this. Let's see, I want to take it down. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I thought of this while I was teaching. Even my mind. I, I, was teaching. I was like, what if I made that a blackboard? And then I could do it. Okay. What is it? Um, parentheses 7 plus x to the 8 to the 3rd. X to the seven. Dx. Okay. Let u equal seven plus x to the eight. Then du dx would equal eight x to the seven. So that's a good thing. That means that du equals eight x to the seventh dx, but I don't have an a. I wish I did that. So what I could do is I could say du over eight equals x to the seventh dx, which I do have. I do have that. So let's do that. Okay. That would give me uh, u cubed over 8 du, I believe. OK, I can make that a little nicer for myself. I'll just pull out the 1 8 because I don't, I don't need it for the actual calculation. For the integrand, I don't need it. Just multiply by 1 8 at the end. OK, now I add 1 here. So that would give me u to the fourth. I want that four to go away when I take the derivative. So that would give me one fourth in the front. Okay. Uh, plus c. Eight times four is 32. u to the fourth plus c. And then let's sub back in one. 32nd, 7 plus x to the 8th to the 4th plus c, I think. What does the computer say? That's right. Oh, good. I accidentally did 1 7 instead of 1 8. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it seems like my background is fine. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so uh, I finally, yeah, I, look, look <laughs> everyone, I discovered something on my own. I have something to present in my math meeting. Uh, I'll be like, look what I found. You could change the background. What a novel thing. All right, anyway, small victories. Let's keep going. I'm going to change it from white. That wouldn't help you very much. Maybe we'll keep... Maybe it's easier to see. Okay. Now we don't have parentheses anymore. 
Let's see what happens. Let's see, u equals six plus eight x. What happens? If I take du dx, I would just get eight. Oh, that's kind of nice because I already have an eight. So I have an eight right there sitting for me, or at least I do. I don't know if you do for your problems, but I do. Lucky for me, huh? So du equals eight dx. And I have eight dx. So I could rewrite this as just du u. Well, what was that? That was the one with the negative one. And that was a special part. D e x of ln x equals one over x. So that means that this is ln of u. Natural log of u. Now what was u? U was six plus eight x. They that's the answer. Not clear, but safe. Yeah, okay. Cassandra, don't hesitate to stop me if I need to go over something again. Okay, don't hesitate to stop. All right, let's see what happens here. I have a natural logarithm of x to the 16 over x. Natural logarithm of x is the worst, so maybe I will let that be you. Usually with the thing in the parentheses that helped before. If I take the thing in the parentheses to be you that helped before, so maybe it'll help again. Okay. If that's true, then what? Du dx is one over x. So that means du equals dx over x. And I have that. I have dx over x. That's ln x to the 16 dx over x. I have dx over x. So that's just du. So then I think this is u to the 16th du. And I know how to do that. So I just add one, and that would be 17. And I counteract that with a 1 17th. Okay, and then plus C. What was my original U? It was natural logarithm. So it's going to be 1 17th, natural log X, 17 plus C. that similar to what you had? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just different numbers. What numbers did you have? Um, I have 27 instead of 16. Okay. So it's I think it would be 128 natural logarithm to the 28th, right? Mm -hmm. After doing this, I think I can do it. I just changed the maximum. 
I guess we'll see, right? Wait, John. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. See what happens here. Now we have e3x plus 7 dx. Well, I know quite a bit about the natural exponent. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. And I can even say that e to the 2x dx is one half e to the 2x. Let's see. So we, do, and we have a pretty good cheat sheet going for natural logarithms. But now we have an issue where it's an, um, it's an expression on the inside. Let's see what happens if I let this be u. And then take the derivative. If I do that, then du dx equals three. I don't have a three in my expression, but I might be able to counteract it just a little bit. So that means that du equals three dx. Okay. And I don't have a three. I only have dx. So dx just equals du over three. And I could plug that in for dx. And I have all those pieces. So that means that this would be e to the u over three du. Should be able to do that. I can pull out the one third. That's not going to change anything. Okay. It's its own integral. I just have to do plus C. So that's one third E to the U plus C. And then I'll just sub in what I had before. So one third E to the three X plus seven plus C. Good. Natural logarithm, pretty easy to play with. Not too bad. So got another one to go. Make sure it makes sense. Dx. Now, before when I made the exponent the u, that worked out. So I'm going to try that again and see what happens. So let's take the derivative of this. Let's see what happens. If I take the derivative of it, I'm the five goes away. I'll just get the one eleventh. So what does that mean? du equals 1 11th dx. And there's no 1 11th over here. I don't have one. So what I can do is I can solve for dx equals 11 du. And I have a dx. That's all I have. So I can sub that in. All right. That would make this 11 times e to the u du. It should be equivalent to what I had before. Pull the 11 out. 
It's its own integral, just as it's its own derivative. So that's e to the u plus c. Now I'll sub back in what I had, 11 e to the x over 11 plus 5 plus c. Don't know if it's playing well to you, but what I'm trying to do is slowly build you up to where you need to go. And if you notice in the past few problems, what I've been doing is solving for dx because I didn't have it. And that is a good strategy to be able to deal with this because eventually you're gonna go, I don't know if I'm supposed to multiply or divide at this point. And you can determine that by setting up with what you have. So I had du dx one. Let me set up my pointer because you can't see it on one of them. That's not good. So I had du dx. I solved for that. I didn't have 111. All I had was dx. So I solved for dx. So I knew it was 111 times du. And I didn't have to play it because eventually you're going to pull your hair out and you're going to think, am I multiplying? Am I dividing? What am I even doing? It'll get so tied up. I know because I've been there. So it helps if you solve for what you have. Okay. And we'll see that in harder problems, but we're trying to build you up as we go along. So far, so good with the U substitution. We haven't, we haven't been stopped yet, so let's keep going. We have x to the ninth, e, x to the tenth, dx. So far, what we've done is we've let the exponent be u. We take the derivative of that exponent, which gives me 10x to the ninth. Then we solve for du. And we say, OK. Well, what do we have? We have 10. No, we don't have 10. We only have x. Let me circle what we do have. So it's clear what I'm trying to get across. We have this. We don't have 10. We don't have that 10. I wish we did, but we don't. Okay? So we can solve for what we do have and then go from there. That's what I'm going to do. So what do I have? What I have is I have x to the ninth dx, which is du over 10. So that means I'm going to divide by 10. Pull the one pen out. And I know that the integral of e to the u du is just e to the u. So this is one tenth e to the u plus c. And from there, I can just sub in what my u was, which was x to the tenth. So that's one tenth e to the x to the 10, let's see. Now, what does the question actually ask? That's how we do it. What did it actually ask? It said, determine the change of variables from x to u, choose the correct answer below. I let u be the exponent, x to the 10. That seemed to work out for me. Then it says, write the integral in terms of u. Okay, so that's what I did. One tenth e to the u du. And then I solved it and subbed back in my u for x. One tenth e to the x to the tenth plus c. Let's see, that would be kind of messy if I have it all at once. I also have a picture of that too.
I can say as a student, I was pretty careless and I would just want to rush, rush, rush. But it can be really helpful when you do that du dx to solve for what you have. That way you don't have to play the mind game of, okay, do I multiplying or dividing what's going on? Because you will get, you'll get twisted up. Questions about that? Integral t to the fourth e to the negative t to the fifth dt. Okay, so far so good with the letting u be the exponent. Then du dt is negative five t to the fourth. And it looks like I have t to the fourth, but I don't have negative five. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. du is negative five t to the fourth dt. And I have t to the fourth dt. I have that, I just don't have that negative five. So what I'm going to do is divide both sides by negative five, and that's equivalent. Du divided by negative five equals t to the fourth dt. And from there, I could plug that in and evaluate. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So we have negative one fifth e to the u, du. I can pull the negative one fit out. Well, e to the u, it's its own derivative, its own integral, so negative one fifth. e to the, Negative t to the fifth plus c. See what happens with this one over five plus four x. Here it seems like I should let u be five plus four x. Right. So du dx would just be four. So du equals four dx. I don't have a four in the original problem. It's just sad. So I can just solve for dx, and that's du divided by 4. Those are equivalent. So I can rewrite this as the integral of 1 over u du over 4, and that will be the same. Pull the 1 fourth out, and I just have 1 over u du. What is the integral of one over u? We need to remember that d over dx of ln of x is one over x. So I think that being said, this has to be natural log. One fourth natural log of u. I'm gonna put it in absolute value because I don't wanna have domain issues plus c. 
And then I can sub back in my U. So that would be one fourth ln five plus four X plus C. one looks similar from inspection. I let u equal one plus 20 x du dx equals 20. So du equals 20 dx, but I don't have a 20 here. So I'm gonna solve for dx, dx equals du, over 20. Now I can rewrite this as 1 20th, 1 over u, du. And I can pull out the 120 because that's just a constant. 1 over u, du. Okay, well, we remember d over dx of the natural logarithm of x equals one over x. So this is 1 20th ln absolute value of x, avoid the domain error. That should be fine. So 1 20th ln, and then I had one plus 20 x plus c as my u. This one looks similar as well. Let's see if it is. Let's let u equal one minus dx and du dx to be negative eight. Okay, so du is negative eight dx. I don't have a negative eight. All I have is a dx. So I'm gonna solve for dx and that gives me du over negative eight. So from here, what can I do? I could say that this is negative one eighth, one over u, du. I can pull out the negative one eighth, one over u, du, and that's the natural logarithm as we talked about before. I think this is negative one eighth ln x plus c. Whoops. And sub back in my u. One minus eight x. So that was very similar to the previous problem. This is a little bit different. Let's see. DS, okay. 4e to the 4s over 9 plus e to the 4s DS. 
What happens if I let u equal 9 plus e to the 4s? And du dx equals 4e to the 4s. And I have that. I have 4e to the 4s. So du is 4e to the 4s. And I should have put, not that you guys are going to be too strict on me, but I should have put ds there, not dx. Okay. So I have this piece. That's up here. So that's just du. And so I think that means I can rewrite this as 1 over u du. And I know that the derivative is just 1 over s. So then that must mean this is just the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And I'll sub back in my u. Nine plus e to the four s plus c. What about this? Okay, there's no denominator here. I'm going to rewrite this. I'm sure, I understand what's going on. Okay. So if I let u be the thing inside parentheses, and I take the derivative of that du dy, then I would get negative 14 y. So that means that du equals negative 14 y dy. And I don't have that. What I have is 7y. And what I need is negative 14y for that to be a one-to-one -one thing, one-to-one -one correspondence, and I don't have it. So how can I get that to be a negative, or I need it to be a positive 7, and I have negative 14. Hopefully it's clear what the conundrum is. I have a negative 14y. I need a positive 7y. So I think if I just divided both sides by negative 2, that that would be the same thing. That should, I can do that with equations. Divide both sides by the same thing. And that would be equivalent to what we have. So now I think I can rewrite this as negative one half square root u du. Think, think, think. If that's true, and I can just pull out negative one half. I don't need that anymore. And I just have square root of u du. Did we already do that one? Can't remember. Well, that's to the one half. You add one. So one half plus one. It's one half plus two over two, three halves. 
Okay, so this is going to be negative half times u to the three halves. But I need to multiply by the reciprocal because I need that part to go away when we take the derivative. So I think that would be two thirds. I think, I think, I think. If that's true, well, let me add C. If this is true, it looks like those twos happen for my numbers happen to cancel. So I'd just be left with negative one third u three half plus c. And as long as I haven't made any mistakes, I should be able to sub in u at this point. And that was supposed to be a, that squiggle was supposed to be. A three. Like it was going to be easy. I had to think about it a little bit in that middle part. I like that problem. I think I don't think I have to. I'd be willing to. It's that middle part where I have to figure out the du, and it was for my numbers, it was a negative or it was positive seven versus negative fourteen. That's where I have to be. That's where I have to really. I don't know why, but just figuring out that constant. Like, mm -hmm. What were your numbers? Mine was so for the. Yeah, so my outside of the equation, like outside of the radical, it was 6y to the 8. Here? Yeah. And it was 5 minus 6y to the 9. Like that? Mm -hmm. So if that was our problem, then we'd have 5 minus 6y to 9. B U A Y equals negative fifty four Y to the eighth. Okay. Then D U equals negative fifty four Y to the eighth D Y. And we don't have negative fifty four. What we have is six. So we have to think, what are we going to do to make that equivalent? So what do we have to divide by? What was it? Negative nine. Negative nine. We divide both sides by the equation and they're equivalent. Okay, so then we have the square root of u divided by negative 9 du. I can pull out the negative 9 square root u du. Okay. Well, that's to the 1 half. This is negative 9. This would be u and yours wouldn't cancel. One seven. Six y to the ninth, we have C that we got. Mm -hmm. okay, good. 
Because I, I knew, yeah, there's, I can see with randomizing that number, different situations are going to come up. So I'm mm-hmm. curious what you had. I'm sure whoever's listening to this in the future, they're going to have different numbers. It's that middle step. I, it, it's not hard, but it just, I have to like stop. Okay, what do I need to do now? I have to actually kind of think about it. I was 27. Let's see what 28 ranks. Uh, so what does it bring? It brings, we are evaluating this at from zero to eight with my numbers. 2xe to the x squared dx. Okay. What if u equals x squared? Then du dx equals 2x. And then I can solve for du. And I have, I actually have 2x dx there. 2x in the front and dx. So I can do a straight substitution of tricks 0, 8. And then you have e to the u, du. Okay. So from there, what do I have? I have e to the u plus c. I need to sub in so I have e to the eighth minus oh 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 skip it steps e to the u which is x squared plus c so there's my integral and I need to evaluate that from zero to eight with my numbers so e to the eighth squared minus e to the zero squared any well zero times zero is zero. So anything to the zeroth is just one. So that's just going to go to one. So this is e to the 64th minus one. I don't, okay, so I couldn't remember if we needed to evaluate that exactly or we need to approximate it with the calculator. And this one, it looks like exactly. Question on that one. What did you have? Yes. Mine was one and zero. One and zero. Yeah, like one at the top and zero at the bottom. Like for the inter- Oh, 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 oh. Zero to one. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know how to say this. And then I had 6x to the fifth. Ex to the sixth. Like that? Okay, uh, so if u equals x to the sixth, and then du equals 6x to the fifth, du dx would equal 6x to the fifth. Okay, so that means du equals 6x to the fifth dx. What do I have? I have 6x to the fifth dx. So I have all of this. So I can do a straight substitution. No fancy dividing both sides by this or that. So I think I can go from 0 to 1, e to the u, du, because all the extra stuff would just be built into du. 
All right, then that would be e to the u plus c from zero to one. Constant will go away when we subtract. So this is e to the first minus e to the zeroth. I need to be careful. That is true, but I need to be a little more careful. That's e to the one to the six minus e to the zero to the six, which happens to also be e to the first minus e to the zero, which is e minus one. So if it's like to the first, it's it just is. It just is itself. Okay. See what happens with this swap. So we have parentheses. Usually, what we do is we let the thing inside the parentheses be the change of variable. And I think we should at least try that again. du dx plus 2x. Okay. So du equals 2x dx. In my version, I have x dx. I have an x here, I have a dx here. I don't have the two. So what do I do? I think if I divide both sides by two, I have the same thing. So that means I have du over two for my substitution. Okay, that means I have from one to two, One half u to the eighth du. I can pull out the one half, that's just a constant. One to two u to the eighth du. I need to add one to the exponent and then divide by that. So that would be u to the ninth. One ninth plus C evaluated in my problem one to two. Let's clean this up a little bit. I have one eighteenth and then sub back in what I had originally. One to two. Okay, so it looks like I need to plug in two and one to this and evaluate what this is. So this is one eighth, two squared minus one to the ninth, minus one eighth, one squared minus one to the ninth. Well, that's just gonna go to zero because one minus one is zero. So for my numbers, that went to zero. This will not, that's four minus one, which is three. So I have three to the ninth divided by eight. I made mistakes. Oh, I think you're supposed to have one eighteenth. 
Oh my goodness, it's a slipped pen. That's all it takes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's, let's try this one. And I still got a little time, so I'll leave that link. What if I let the denominator be the U substitution, then du dx would be 2x plus 1. Well, coincidentally, that's what I have up here. So du equals 2x plus 1 dx, and I have that. I can rewrite this from 2 to 6, 1 over u, the u. And I know that e over dx ln of x, to one over x. So I think this is ln of u plus c evaluated from 2 to 6. Stuff back in our u. So this is ln x squared plus x minus 3. Six ln six squared plus six minus three minus natural logarithm two squared plus two. I was able to simplify the logarithm. So this is a uh, natural logarithm of 39 minus 3. By logarithm rules, I can turn that to 39 over 3, which gives me natural logarithm of 13. Just using the log rules. That's just the log rule, though. But there was some kind of I think one more problem will do it. Let's see what this one brings. Okay. So, so far in class today, what we've discovered is if we let a change of variable thing inside the parentheses, that usually brings about some luck. So let's see if it continues. D to dx in this case would be 2x. So du 
equals 2x dx. And I do not have that. What I have is 8x dx. So it's kind of like the opposite problem they have. I need 8x, but I have 2x. So what do I need to do to both sides to get that to be true? I could multiply both sides by 4, and that would be true. So 4 times du, in this case, would give me what I need. Okay. And let's do that. I'll change variables. Root. 26, 0, 4 times the square root of u, du. So I, I need 8x, I had 2x. I only have, or, yeah, I'm sorry. du is 2x dx. I have an 8x, so what do I need to do to make it work? I could do 4 times. 4 times du would be what I have. That makes sense. Yeah, I get that. I just no, you'll be able to explain. No, go ahead. I think I'm just looking at it. Um, yeah, I definitely. I just like for some reason I was thinking eight x to the third because I just. Oh, oh, oh! That's and then and I'm, I'm worried about. Time. No, I worry about it. this. Is um. Sorry. So that that it's a cube root. This is cube root. So when we do this, what are we going to get? We're going to add one, four thirds. So we should get a four thirds. To counteract that, we'll multiply it by three fourths. So that's going to give us three fourths of u to the four thirds plus c. And then we just need to evaluate. Yeah. All right. Let me know if you have any questions. Please email me rpanel at ivytech.com or email, sorry. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Next time we will review for the final one. Now, if you have any questions.